Hello, welcome to Professor Monzon's World of Animals. Today, we continue exploring the diversity of animal life. In this video, we will focus on the early tetrapods and modern amphibians. We will follow the outline of Hickman's Integrated Principles of Zoology, Chapter 25. We will begin by discussing what it means to go from water to land in ontogeny and phylogeny. Then we'll talk about the Devonian origin of the early, te early tetrapods. And then we will transition to modern amphibians with a focus on a specific group of amphibians, the frogs and toads, which make up the order Anura. All right. So the movement from water to land is a dramatic event in animal ontogeny and animal phylogeny. By ontogeny, we mean the development of a single animal. So for example, an amphibian, uh, be beginning its development in water and then continuing its development in land uh, or to go on to live on land is a dramatic transformation. Similarly, the evolution of um, vertebrates starting as solely aquatic animals and then evolving adaptations to permit them to colonize land was a dramatic event in animal evolution. Think about it. Life originated in water. The bodies of animals are composed mostly of water and most cellular activities require water. So going from water onto land required, requires lots of modifications to the animal to permit them to go into these very different environments. Let me ask you this, which other organisms made the evolutionary transition to land before the vertebrates? By this time, you should already know, we've discussed various phyla that have made the transition to land before the vertebrates. All right, I want to ask you this, and I'll give you some time to think about these questions. What developmental modifications are necessary for an aquatic tadpole to become a terrestrial adult? The other question is, what evolutionary modifications are necessary for an aquatic vertebrate to become a terrestrial tetrapod? If you think about it, these are really the same questions, but one is focusing on ontogeny, the development of an individual tadpole, and the other one is focusing on phylogeny, the evolution of vertebrates. So I want to give you one minute to think about it, and I'll disappear for that minute while you put something down on paper or on your screen. All right, I'm back. So hopefully you have thought about this and have some ideas of the different developmental or evolutionary modifications that were required for vertebrates to make that transition onto land. If this was a live session, we would uh, discuss your ideas a little bit, but uh, since this is a recorded session, uh, let's go on. There are certain physical differences that must be addressed when moving from water to land. For example, oxygen is 
20 times more abundant in air and diffuses more rapidly. So animals must possess lungs or skin suitable for respiratory gas exchange. Also, air is about a thousand times less dense and 50 times less viscous than water. So it provides less buoyancy than water. Limbs and skeletons must therefore support more weight. And lastly, air fluctuates in temperature more rapidly than water. So animals must adjust to the extreme habitat conditions like freezing, thawing, and drying. Modern amphibians make this necessary, uh, these necessary modifications during their own ontogeny. So amphibians undergo this remarkable transformation that changes them from aquatic juveniles to terrestrial adults. In amphibians, masses of eggs hatch in the water into limbless, gill-breathing, fish-like tadpole larvae that feed and grow in that aqueous environment. And then they undergo this remarkable transformation called metamorphosis. The word means change in form. And it starts with the appearance of hind legs, the shortening of the tail, the loss of larval teeth and gills, development of eyelids to keep those eyes moist in outside of the water, and the emergence of forelimbs. So here is basically the life cycle and metamorphosis of a leopard frog. No, just kidding. This is a little too oversimplified. This is a figure from your textbook that shows the life cycle and metamorphosis of a leopard frog. Let's start over here. Let's start over here. So here we have this male frog that is clasping this female frog and he's going to mate with her as she sheds her eggs in the water. He is at the same time shedding his sperm and fertilizing these eggs. And so now here we have a fertilized egg or a zygote that is surrounded by this jelly. In that jelly mass, the zygote is going to go through cleavage and it's going to continue developing. Here developing some um, a anterior posterior axis and then that embryo is going to uh, grow into a tadpole. Uh, usually they are herbivorous tadpoles that feed, feed on algae. Uh, you see as it's going to begin its process of metamorphosis, you have these hind limbs and the forelimbs emerge. The tail is going to um, begin to shrink. And here we have a sexually mature frog that is ready to mate and begin the life cycle all over again. Now, before we talk about modern amphibians, let's talk about where did amphibians come from in the first place, the origin of tetrapods, because amphibians belong to a larger group of animals called the tetrapods. The name means four feet. So where did the four feet come from? Well, they came from the fins of fish. Which fish? Remember last time we talked about the lobe fin fish, the group called Sarcopterygii. Traditionally, the Sarcopterygii excluded the terrestrial tetrapods and only included uh, the coelacanth and the um, lungfishes. But now we know from the latest genomic evidence that uh, Sarcopterygii, Sarcopterygii is a paraphyletic group if we exclude the tetrapods. Remember that that latest genomic, uh, uh, the latest genomic evidence uh, shows that it is the lung fishes that are the fishes that are most closely related to the tetrapods. So here we have the coelacanth, the, the, the lung fishes, and the sister group of lungfishes is all of these tetrapods right here. The tetrapods uh, include the amphibians that are the focus of today's lesson and the amniotes that we will cover 
another another time. Basically, um, oh, actually, let me ask you this in the next slide. Oh, let me show you this in the next next slide. This is a cladogram of uh, the tetrapods, but also showing the sister group of the tetrapods being the lungfishes here. Okay, so what are the things that you should uh, be focusing on here in this in this cladogram? Well, they're highlighted here in this red box. Look at uh, some of the features of all these tetrapods. You have the presence of digits, right? Fingers and toes on the forelimbs and on the hind limbs. Tetrapods have definitive ankle and wrist joints. So not just these fins that do this, but now you have um, these joints that permit the limb to bend in different directions. Those are the wrists and the ankles. Tetrapods, tetrapods have well-developed pectoral and pelvic skeletons, okay? The pectoral is for uh, the, like the shoulder girdle and the chest area to support the forelimbs, and the pelvic girdle is there to support the hind limbs. Tetrapods also have strengthened and eventually directed limbs, uh, ribs, so unlike the fishes, which tend to be uh, laterally flattened like this, and the ribs are sort of oriented this way, tetrapods tend to strengthen their ribs and they put them more ventrally here to support their weight on land. And they also have numerous skull modifications since they're going to be breathing air and, uh, yeah, breathing oxygen from the air and not extracting it from water through their gills. All right, let me move this aside, move myself aside, so you can see that the limbs of tetrapods evolved from the limbs of Paleozoic lobe fin fishes. So here in the textbook, you have this figure with several uh, fossil animals that are thought to be predecessors of tetrapods. The first one is Eustonoptera. This was a late Devonian lobe fin fish that lived around 385 million years ago. The bones of uh, the bones of the muscular anterior fins foreshadowed the bones of tetrapod limbs. Check this out. So we zoom into the fin, we can see that here we have a clavicle, right? We have a clavicle that's, that's our, our, um, our collarbone. So here we have this clavicle, we have the humerus, which is uh, a precursor to the upper arm. We have an ulna and radius, which are uh, precursors to the lower arm of tetrapods. And then we have all these little bones, which are going to be homologous to our wrist bones. Notice that the clavicle here is attached to the skull over here, to these skull bones, as is typical of all fishes. So this was definitely a fish still fully aquatic, still um, had all the features that make a fish a fish. However, if we fast forward about 20 million years, uh, we see Acanthostega. It was one of the earliest known true tetrapods. It had eight fully evolved fingers. Look at these little fingers with their little carpals, right? Meaning these are the wrist bones. We see the humerus and the radius and ulna, which form the architecture of the forelimb of all tetrapods. Check out where uh, the shoulder is, the pectoral girdle here is separated from the skull as opposed to the last animal we saw where it was attached to the skull. So this means that this animal had a neck. It had a much more mobile head because its clavicle was not fused to its skull. Although this animal could 
probably walk on its four limbs, it appeared that it had weak limbs and was probably still fully aquatic. At about the same time, there lived another animal, Ichthyostega. This was another of the earliest known food tetrapods. It had fully formed tetrapod limbs with seven toes in the hind limb. So here it has, these are definitely not fins, right? You see that these are definitely hind limbs and forelimbs. If we zoom in to the hind limb, we see that it has seven toes here with it the tarsals, meaning this, are the, this is the ankle of the hind limb, and the hind limb is made up of a femur and a tibia and fibula, much like our own hind limb, our own legs. This animal had stronger limbs, it had a strong vertebrae, strong neck, strong ribs and shoulder and hip girdles, so we think that this animal actually walked on land. Interestingly, you can see that this animal had a very fish-like head. In fact, that's what its name means. Ichthyostega means that its roof, like the roof of its skull, is shaped like that of a fish. So this animal had a fish-like head and a fish-like tail. So it also very likely lived in water and so it um, very likely had an amphibious lifestyle. Then if we fast forward a couple of million years, we see Limnocilus. This was a carboniferous tetrapod that had five digits on both the front and the hind limbs. We call that a pink pentadactyl pattern or pentadictyly. This pattern is characteristic of most extant tetrapods, right? If you look at your hands, you hopefully see that you have five fingers on each um, hand and five toes on each foot. Well, this is a pattern that is very common across tetrapods. It's almost as if early in tetrapod evolution, uh, animals were just tinkering, tinkering around with the number of digits and they, uh, for the most part, landed on five as a number of digits. All right, let me ask you this before we get to really discuss modern amphibians. <clears throat> when did the earliest fossils attributable to modern amphibians appear? Check out figure 25.1 to attempt to answer that question. Also, which extinct group of animals is most closely related to modern amphibians? Check out the cladogram on figure 25.2 to attempt to answer that question. All right, let's talk about modern amphibians for a bit. There are about 7,900 extant species and they are in three orders of class amphibia. There is order Anura, the frogs and toads, order Eurodila, the salamanders, and order Gymnophiona, the Sicilians, which are these weird limbless amphibians. These are some properties of almost all amphibians. They basically have aquatic larvae and terrestrial adults. Adults, for the most part, are quadrupedal, meaning they have four limbs, except for those in order Agymnophiona, those Sicilians that I just showed you. Amphibians tend to be dependent on water because eggs must be deposited in water or, or a moist environment. The aquatic larvae use gills for respiration, much like fishes do, but they metamorph what, after they go through metamorphosis, the adults use cutaneous respiration meaning they basically breathe through their skin and they also may use their lungs. Larvae are fully aquatic. Larvae and fully aquatic adults retain the lateral line senses. Wait a minute. 
I thought they had terrestrial adults. Well, a few species go through this metamorphosis, but even the adults remain fully aquatic, like this animal that appears to be smiling here called the axolotl. The axolotl may remain permanently gilled. It's weird that it, it may remain permanently gilled unless it decides not to. Basically, this animal has this remarkable ability to become terrestrial if its aquatic environment dries up. They, they, they live in ponds which tend to dry up and if that happens, no problem. They just lose their gills and then they are able to um, breathe air. Amphibians have paired nostrils, right? So they have not, uh, nares that open to a nasal cavity lined with an olfactory epithelium to sense airborne odors, so they have a good sense of smell. And they have a tympanic membrane and internal ears to detect sounds. We'll see that when we dissect the frog, that they have this little membrane that vibrates, much like our own tympanum um, permits us to detect the vibrations in air. The eyelids and the lacrimal glands or the tear glands of amphibians keep their eyes protected and moist when they're not in the water. And they have a chambered heart with two atria and one ventricle. That's really cool. Remember how many fish have? How many chambers fish, fish hearts have? They have one atrium and one ventricle. But amphibians have two atria and one ventricle. So I mentioned that about 7,900 species exist in class amphibia in three orders. Well, one of those orders, order Anura, is made of about 7,000 species of frogs and toads. Anurans are basically tailless amphibians that are specialized for jumping. Because they are ectotherms, meaning that their body temperature depends on the external environment, they are, and, and they are dependent on water, their distribution is limited to warm and moist regions. However, some species can survive in the Arctic and some others can survive in deserts. Now, let me ask you, how do you think wood frogs survive the winter even in the Arctic? What adaptations do you think they possess that keep them from freezing? One of the hot topics right now in conservation biology is uh, knowing that amphibian species are declining and going extinct around the world. This is very alarming, and so it's important that we understand why. So what are the three main causes of amphibian declines worldwide? I'll leave you with those two questions for you to find on your own through your reading. I want to share a quick video before we wrap up our discussion of the amphibians. Hailing from the Pacific Northwest, the rough-skinned newt is one rough customer. Looking for tiny invertebrates, it has wandered out of its riverside territory and into the garter snakes. The newt seems unaware or unconcerned. Tiny glands in its skin are home to deadly bacteria. They produce tetrodotoxin, a lethal poison that paralyzes the muscles, stopping the diaphragm and heart. Garter snakes, though, have evolved a tetrodotoxin tolerance. An arms race between snake and newt has led to higher and higher levels of both resistance and toxicity. 
to the point that the newt contains enough poison to kill a creature far larger than its normal predators, like a human. So the question becomes, which animal is further along in the race? The newt arches its back and displays its orange underbelly, a clear signal that it's not to be messed with. The garter snake decides it's not worth the risk. But the same cannot be said for all predators. The newt returns to its stream only to encounter another threat one closer on the family tree, a bullfrog. Bullfrogs are insatiable and indiscriminate. It swallows the newt whole. Inside the bullfrog's belly, it's a race between the stomach's acids and the newt's poison. The frog collapses and dies. The newt climbs out and is finally on the way home. All right, that nude, hopefully he made it home. Imagine what he's gonna tell his parents. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video, the lesson on these fascinating little amphibians. And I'll see you next time. Until then, be strong and courageous.